We're glad to be joined this afternoon by Mike Petty with uh, Thermal Radar, one of our uh, technology partners in the uh, Works with DW Spectrum webinar. And so Mike is going to be talking about his uh, his solution. So um, Mike, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, Thermal Radar? Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, yeah, Thermal Radar has been a product in the market for six years. Uh, we started uh, selling product back in 2014. Um, product was initially developed uh, 2012, 2013, and released in 2014. Um, the, the founders of the company were looking to design a product that could do um, better thermal detection than uh, other standard thermal kind of systems that were on the market. Um, and they did this by figuring out a way to rotate a sensor. So instead of each camera having, each fixed camera having a sensor in it, they found a way to rotate the sensor. And so this is the thermal radar that you're seeing here in this video. So it comes across a little bit over the internet, a little, uh, a little jerky, but it's a pretty fluid motion to have it move. But what the unit is actually doing is stopping. Um, and so we do continuous 360 degree uh, thermal detection out of this unit. We use a FLIR boson sensor in that unit and that FLIR boson rotates and we're, we stop the camera uh, between let's say eight and 15 times to do a full rotation. So every field of view, as you can see in the little graphic, um, we have what we call stops or stations. So when thermal radar rotates from stop number one to two to three to four, et cetera, that you get that uh, perspective from the camera with a specific field of view, ultimately culminating in a full 360 degree view. By doing this and doing the edge analytics that we are able to do inside the camera, we're able to detect humans up to, uh, think of a big circle that's 200 acres wide, okay? Oh, if you go back to the previous slide real quick, Sure. Um, the uh, So 200 acres of coverage for a human detection, vehicle detection up to 1,700 acres, and then wildfire detection up to 20,000 acres. And so basically, if you think of, uh, and the way we came up with those numbers is we can detect a human-sized character uh, at about 500, up to 500 meters in radius. And so by doing the area of a circle, times uh, a five, with a 500 meter radius, you start to get to those numbers for human detection, vehicle detection, wildfire detection, et cetera. So most of the work that we do is for power utility companies, oil and gas, mining operations, anywhere where there's big open space and no one should be there, we then become a solution for thermal detection and then targeted surveillance using the DW PTZ camera. There are five variations of thermal radar, as you can see from the boson sensors there. So we make two versions that are lower resolution. They're a 320 by 240 resolution. And then we make three sensors that are 640 by 480. Uh, and, and you use different sensors for different applications. Uh, usually I'll consult with customers on what they're trying to do so that we can pick out the right sensor for what their need is. If they say, look, I just need the biggest range that you have, then obviously we go to the 6600 unit that has the widest coverage area and the most detection area. So we do a full spin of the camera every one to two seconds. So it takes one to two seconds to do a full 360 degrees of coverage. And we can customize areas of interest, so detection zones uh, within that panorama. So you can say, okay, here's an area I wanna watch, here's another area, or if you want, hey, I just wanna watch all of it. So you can pick and choose. We can also do masking, so you can mask areas that definitely don't need to have detections in them. We also offer a very unique application with our sensor called a blur mask. So sometimes in thermal, you'll get uh, thermal deviations, variations in thermal from trees waving or waves on the ocean that are kind of crashing. You'll get some thermal disturbance there and, and those tend to generate some false alarms. With our blur mask, we, we are able to blur the pixels in those areas so that you're not getting repetitive motion alarms like you do with typical thermal uh, detection systems. So one of the unique things that we do. So when people say you're, do, you're doing 360 degree detection, how do you show that? 
how does that display? So if you can go to the next slide and I'll show you how this displays. We, we come off of our camera as an RTSP stream. So if you notice the top of the screen, you'll have uh, about, uh, what is that, eight uh, uh, frames up there. So you've got uh, uh, a top screen that's gonna show you 180 degrees. And then down on the bottom is another film strip where you're showing another 180 degrees. So between that, that's your 360 degrees. And each one of those uh, little uh, windows is going to update every millisecond with a new image thermal radar is throwing at it. So this screen is continuously updating based upon the new imagery coming through in all of those sections in the upper top of the screen and the lower bottom of the screen. The middle section is what we call our alarm area. So when we get an alarm in one of these spots, like you'll notice down in the lower right, we're getting an alarm out of that lower right uh, uh, field of view, then we flash that into the middle as an alarm. The other thing we're able to do is we're able to measure from the thermal radar to the target and we measure pixels to put an estimate on the location or the GPS location of the target. So with every detection we give you, we give you a GPS coordinate. And with that coordinate, you can do a variety of things. You can slew other cameras to that position. So uh, within DW, we should be able to uh, have our alarm. So a certain area of detection is going to trigger an alarm in digital watchdog spe spectrum. And then we're going to be able to have spectrum drive other pan tilt zoom cameras to that location so that you can have four or five cameras watching it. So as a, as a nice example of what thermal radar does, this is a, a little video of us uh, walking uh, around a property. So you see me in the visual camera walking. That's about 175 meters. The visual camera is making slight adjustments because the thermal is detecting me and telling the PTZ to make an adjustment. So then all of a sudden on the other side of the property, we get the PTZ that moves. And during the demo, my customer said, why'd the PTZ move? What's going on? Well, here comes some random person being detected and walking up the other side of the property. The guy was not part of the demo, but really illustrated the, uh, the approach of being able to detect two targets coming from different directions. So in essence, one camera system for that site was all they needed to do for the entire project. And then it reacquires me coming out from behind the buildings where I was hidden from thermal and hidden from the PTZ. And now the thermal picks me up again, drives the PTZ to my position, and there I am walking by the fence line. I always like to point out that unlike what we would call traditional ground radar systems, thermal uh, systems see through fences. So ground radar is not able to penetrate, penetrate a chain link fence. So if somebody's walking around your property behind a chain link fence and you're using a radar system, what I would call a true radar system, that radar signal is blocked by that fence, uh, but thermal comes right through the fence. So we do really well in fence line areas like substations and power facilities, um, obviously uh, oil and gas and transfer stations, things like that. Going to some of the bullet points you see here, geospatial locating, we talked about the, the graphical user interface for that 360 coverage area is something very unique. We offer uh, a solution that has no export license. I don't know if we have any folks online from other countries, but no export license is required for a thermal radar. Um, and uh, all of the predictive uh, and proprietary adaptive analytics we do, we have a very low false positive uh, rate on our analytics. And we can detect multiple targets from different directions. So just some of those bullet points I think you'll find incredibly valuable. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. There you go. So just as an example, here's uh, what we would call our Hydra unit, the thermal radar that's paired with the DW PTZ camera. So our Hydra unit there on the left is detecting that person out there at uh, about 157 meters in the dark. So that person's wandering out along a fence line in the dark. We're scanning the entire property looking for that person and detecting that guy walking out there with no, literally no lighting at all. That's how well we do. We typically, one of the things we love about the DW spec or the DW PTZs 
is that they've got some IR illumination. So we, we can get some infrared out of the PTZ. So when thermal radar detects a target out at 150, 180, 200 meters, we've got a great megapixel PTZ that can zoom in on that and apply the appropriate IR to that. Um, you'll notice in the bottom picture there, uh, we're detecting a person just standing on the corner of a building. And you may not see that with the naked eye, but the thermal sensor is exceptional at detecting that kind of the uh, target. So uh, you go on the next slide. So just some great things about uh, Spectrum that work incredibly well. Uh, DW Spectrum is a very efficient VMS. Um, in, in what I like to term, it's, it's got a very small footprint, so it doesn't require a lot of uh, heavy uh, servers to do it. And uh, we, we're able, in fact, to run the DW uh, VMS, or the, excuse me, the Spectrum VMS on the thermal radar, so on the head unit. Inside the thermal radar camera, we can be running the, uh, the VMS platform, um, which is a really unique uh, capability that we would have. Uh, the thermal radar just requires one license and then one license for the PTZ. So you're ostensibly getting about eight to 16 thermal cameras with just one license in the system because of the way that we consolidate that and flow the 360 into the VMS. Um, we're great at sending an HTTP uh, message to DW Spectrum and they can receive that. Uh, Patrick, do you want to talk about the alarms and the way that we can trigger DW with the alarms? Sure, yeah, we were talking yesterday. And so because of how you break it down uh, in terms of, you know, and I was, I was looking specifically back at, at this slide with your different stops in your different areas, and you can send different messages based off of those different areas. Uh, and so in Spectrum, we can receive those messages, different messages for each area, and thus we can, um, we can activate different actions through the generic event function in the standard rules engine within DW Spectrum. Yeah. So in, uh, and that includes things like, you know, popping up video on somebody's screen on, on a particular user screen. Uh, you mentioned as far as moving PTZs to presets, uh, but other cameras, not just the hydro, just, not just the camera that is connected to the thermal radar, but, you know, other cameras in the system can, pop up on the screen, can, or if they're PTZs, they can move to those preset locations. Yeah. Uh, taking it out a step even further, you know, we have our, our, our Nightwatch product, which is a line of IP-enabled, PoE-powered uh, illuminating devices. So we've got uh, both uh, IR and white light illuminating devices uh, that can be used, you know, the white light can obviously be used as a deterrent and so you can you can light up different areas of the facility, uh, just sending an HTTP from Spectrum to that light to that illuminating device uh, yeah. based off of of what zone that you that the thermal radar sends. Correct. So a lot of flexibility no, of what we can do with the sediment. No, there really is. No, there really is. Um, the thermal radar only uses 12 watts of power. Um, it might spike at about 15, but typically we're only using 15 watts. Uh, to run a thermal radar. The PTZ uh, will run the wattage, and you know, the PTZ does will run. Uh, it might, uh, if it's using IR illumination, you might increase uh, in your wattage a little bit because of that. But uh, the thermal radar by itself is a fairly low wattage unit. We typically power it uh, through PoE Plus. Uh, that's the way we power a thermal radar, and it feeds obviously right into Spectrum uh, with a single Cat5 connector. Um, pretty easy. Uh, do you want me to show the demo there, Patrick? Yep. Yeah, let me switch over to the uh, switch over to that for a minute. Coming at you. So Patrick's going to make me the presenter. And so you're watching uh, a DW PTZ live tracking a target in our parking lot. Um, we've got a truck that's starting to move and pull out there. And every time you see the PTZ make an adjustment, it just means that thermal radar has detected something and the PTZ is now tasked to go look at it. We typically choose the target by confidence level. So if I'm more confident in the hit from that truck, I'm going to you know, go to the truck first. If I'm more confident in the person, then I'm going to go to the person first. So 
Uh, we'll see if it triggers. Yep, there we go. So as that person moves throughout the property or the truck or whatever, anywhere on the property, we're going to see it. So if you want to see the thermal radar feed itself, so I'm going to highlight that. So again, you see the thermal radar feed up in the top here and you see the thermal radar feed in the bottom. So there's your 360 degrees. And as we track this target walking through the parking lot, he's going to be lit up always in this alarm zone and we show where he's located here on the map. So all of this, everything you see comes in as a single feed into our system and the PTZ then just tracks it. I did want to show something real quick, I, Patrick, I'm just going to uh, light up this little video here. So this is what the thermal radar is actually doing. So as it's spinning, this is what we're showing. This is what the camera is, is um, this is how we're calculating the analytics. And it might make you a little dizzy watching it, but that's how fast the unit is spinning to do that full rotation and be able to uh, uh, do what we do. And then we assemble it in the, uh, excuse me, we, we assemble it in the, uh, you, in the thermal radar and give you the RTSP stream. But the raw feed that you saw with all the flashing pictures through there, that's the raw feed that we're taking and then assembling it into an ONVIF uh, accepted feed into into uh, spectrum. So uh, anyway, re really really neat solution. Again, anytime you're trying to cover a wide area of coverage, especially when it's in the dark and at night, we do exceptionally well with detection and what I call targeted surveillance. So 360 degrees all the time. Um, Patrick, are there other questions or maybe questions people might have or they're sending in? Yeah, and I'll just point out in terms of the, the right notification panel showing you, you know, generic events populating in, into it from the thermal radar. Correct. So sending sending those uh, those event notifications in the spectrum. But you have full capability in the in the in the rules engine to do other things like you know, pop up video, move PTZs to presets, send emails, um, and, and of course through the through the rules engine you can also schedule that. So um, some of the questions that have started to come in, and by all means, anybody with any questions, you know, feel free to type them in the, the uh, go to web webinar interface. We'll try to get to them here. Um, so it's detecting thermal, and somebody's asking about the fire in a forest or ah, somebody's fire. somebody's smart out there. So yeah, thermal radar will do excellent forest detection and you know, like a forest fire. Um, we, we cover a very expansive area because fires are so hot uh, and something you absolutely don't find in nature by itself. Uh, so when a fire starts, we can detect that thermal emissive heat coming from the fire. We typically will see a fire about five kilometers in every direction. So that's a, ten, that's a six mile coverage area in diameter. Um, and like I said earlier, about 20,000 acres in that area. Um, we can run fire detection simultaneously as we're running uh, our thermal uh, intrusion detection. So that's one of the exciting new features we've added is the ability for us to run standard intrusion detection for human and vehicles. But then if you said, hey, we, can we monitor up for a fire around our property as well? Then we just add the fire analytics to the unit and away you go. One of the other innovations we're going to be making is being able to do thermography, which is, uh, let's say you're at a substation and you're wanting to detect whether one of the transformers is overheating, then you can do that. We can put an area of interest around the transformer and detect if it's exceeding uh, a heat that that sh it shouldn't be. So before it catches on fire, before it explodes. So that thermography for equipment monitoring is coming as well here in a couple more months. Um, but so a single device to do all of those things on your property. What's the um, what's the optimal height? What's the hmm. what's, what's that vertical field of view? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so so we we typically tell customers to mount these units between 15 and 40 feet high, maybe 15 meters high if you want to do it in meters. But anywhere under 15 meters is going to be a good spot for us. Um, now if you if you do want to put it high, I've got forestry services that are mounting it quite a bit higher but they're mounting it on a pole uh, that's very well secured. 
so that they, you know, they don't get a lot of movement on the pole. If you've got a lot of movement from the pole, then uh, then you're going to have some issues with the analytics working properly. So it's all about keeping that pole as steady as possible, so the analytics can kind of do their thing. But uh, but as a typical installation for most of our mining operations, uh, oil and gas, crude oil transfer stations, uh, we we typically are about under 40 feet high. So you touched on it a little bit in that video that we had in the um, PowerPoint, um, and these are kind of related, but in terms of prioritization or, or how it prioritizes, and I think this goes back to another question, which is really, you know, in terms of its, the confidence level determined, um, is that confidence level information part of the, part of the, the metadata that can be sent over in the it, generic. It event. is, yeah, it is. So I, I always like to point out that when, in, in thermal radar, when you create a detection zone, um, the detection zone that you create is very specific to the settings you give it. So every zone can be different. So I can set a zone in one parking lot and then another zone in another parking lot from the same camera and they have different settings. Uh, for the sensitivity and the confidence level. So I can say, look, in this area, I want to detect people and vehicles, and only when there's a confidence level of 65 or above. In this other area, I want people and vehicles uh, detected, but only a confidence level of 50 and above. So, and, and that 50 measurement is just a, a, a numerical value we give it to say uh, up to a 95% confidence level. I don't think we ever hit 100% because engineers never like to say 100% of anything. But uh, but typically we're going to do detection and, and give a confidence value. So when we see a car, when we see a person, that could come in at 65. So people ask us all the time, well, how do you differentiate between, you know, deer and dogs and critters? Uh, in, our, in our setup and you when you put the uh, analytics in, uh, if I have our analytics at the lowest level, which is 50, if I simply move it to about a 55 level confidence or percent confidence, then you stop seeing the dog, stop seeing the cats and the deer and things like that. So our analytics are looking some, for some very specific things uh, when they start to, uh, to, to look at whether it's a person or vehicle or whatever it may be. So that's all configurable. And again, the PTZ is gonna be driven to the highest confidence uh, detection at the time. So, so you, you just answered like a dozen questions all in one answer right there. Oh. But, I mean, because the next one, the next one was wildlife. So it was like, yeah. it was all it was, it was teed up perfectly. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, <laughs> we, we do detect wildlife. So if there's any uh, people that love to hunt hogs or deer hunters, man, this is your best friend in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, some more questions about mounting. And, yeah. you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, you, you talked about in terms of mounting height, yes. but um, how does it deal with um, different elevations? Hmm. That's great. Is that's, there, so, is there any? That's, a, that's actually a great question because uh, in the calculations we make in detection, um, the calculations are based upon flat ground, but we have a, an advanced settings uh, component to the setup of the area of interest. And you can say in this area, I'm 40 feet lower in elevation than I am from where the camera is, or I'm up higher, you know, and the detections are gonna be up higher. So by doing that, we're able to put them on the map, but still do very effective detections, even if the, even if the, uh, the ground is uneven or changes or whatnot. So we've put them on mountainsides. We were down in Columbia in Bogota doing a fire detection demo. Uh, and had a, a house up on the mountain that was lighting up some uh, fires and things for us. So yeah, no, it's it's uh, we can do a lot of cool stuff with that. Very cool. So um, does it just detect surface heat, or does it detect um, let's say heat buildup behind an object, whether it's a solid or yeah? So if it's object, a, if a hollow it's object. Yeah, so so we're we're looking for what we're actually looking for. We come at thermal from a data analysis perspective, so we're actually looking at the temperature change going on. So even if something is colder, so again, if something's colder than the environment, we'll detect on that. We're looking for pixelization change 
that's significant. So if I get, if, you know, let's say that guy you're watching right there in the camera, he's getting out of his car. Well, when he got out of his car, he started changing the pixels that he was walking through. The thermal pixels were changing significantly and the heat was different in the new pixels he was populating. So we trigger on that. So we, we, we're looking for, uh, I guess, that kind of change. And then uh, and that's why we drive the PTZ to the target. So thermal radar does the initial detection and then slews the PTZ to say, okay, what, you know, we're, we're saying we detected it. What are we seeing out there? And again, there's a, there's a configuration and a uh, tuning process with our analytics where you say, okay, I have the sensitivity of, of that zone or that area of interest set at this level and my confidence level was this and I wasn't hitting it. So I'm going to increase my sensitivity and make my changes on confidence level so I am detecting those things. So there's a little bit of a tuning process, but once you nail it in, we, we do incredibly well uh, to, to do all the things we're trying to do. So um, I saw a video, and we, did, we didn't talk about this before we launched the webinar here this afternoon, but I know I saw a video on social media where you just came out with some, a couple of people are asking about, do we have pictures of, of mounting locations of, of the combo oh, yeah. between sure. the PGZ? And yeah. I know you just came out with the, uh, the concrete base uh, video just recently. So I don't know if you have that handy. I do, I can show that. Um, here's some, some uh, if you can see my screen, here's some mounting uh, units that we just did recently. The one uh, over on the far left is a natural gas transfer station. Uh, and so we put that unit really high uh, to overlook the entire property. We make all the brackets ourselves. So all of these we make so that they fit the thermal radar and fit the appropriate uh, camera like the digital watchdog PTZ that you're using. So we can do that. Now the other one I was going to show you, and let me do this. I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go to our YouTube channel. We have a great YouTube channel, and uh, and I'll show you the base unit that we've got. It's a pretty neat mobile solution. So if I go to our YouTube channel, and if I make that full screen, oh, let's try this. Okay. So, so this unit, this uh, this unit that we've got, you see this concrete base that we're showing you. You can wheel it out with a pallet jack or a forklift. It's got the the uh, spaces for that. A lightweight, uh, really strong pole though, 110 mile an hour wind pole that just comes right on. You can put all of the uh, nuts and bolts and washers on, lock it down very easily. We have an integrated box that will run the VMS, run the 4G modem that will do everything inside, attach that, and then you attach the proper PTZ and plug it in. It's a, a 110 volt power to the box, and the box feeds the thermal radar the PoE power it needs. And then you are done with, whoop, let's go that way and let's go to there. And there's the, and there's the pole, and it takes about 30 minutes to do that. Very nice. Yeah. So super, super, uh, yeah, super unique application for that. So, are there indoor applications for this, or is it primarily? Yeah. So we also have we also have a trailer system. That's a great point. Thank you for at least reminding me. For those of you who have a mobile deployment um, and you need a solar panel solution that's totally autonomous that will do batteries uh, for the unit and the VMS platform and the 4G modem, everything. This is something, a uh, trailer you can literally just drop and go and it's done. And minimal setup, you can configure it remotely. So uh, yeah, really, really simple system to do. But, uh, but other than that, yeah, we do corner mount brackets on buildings. Uh, we'll do uh, side mount brackets for buildings, uh, pole mounted units. So any kind of mounting configuration you need, we can do. We fabricate all of that here. So, uh, so if you said, hey, I, I need something very special, uh, we can do something very special for you. We have a, a mount that's a, an apex roof mount. So it's a, it fits like the apex of a roof. So it's got two folding sides that come down that can attach to the roof. And then our, our uh, uh, gooseneck bracket comes off of that mount and above the house or above the building. So. Yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of unique ways we can mount this system. Okay. 
Good info. Any other questions? Yeah, um, any others dropping in? Let's see. Does it have to use a PTZ or can you use? You can use a thermal radar all by itself. Specific. Yeah, you don't have to use all a PTZ. Itself. Yeah, you don't have to have a PTZ with it. Yeah, there was a couple of those that came in. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then the other questions that have been coming in are pricing. So I'm oh, going so to flip, uh, right over that. There you go. flip back there. So what I what I yep. what I told Patrick to do is in this slide that he's going to show you, he's going to pull back uh, control. I think he's going to do that. Yeah, there you go. Um, I put our MSRP pricing on there. Like when we go to a trade show and somebody says, "Hey, how much is this unit?" Um, I had I put in our MSRP pricing. Now we typically sell through a uh, a relationship with integrators. So. Um, we haven't found distributors to be incredibly valuable for us because this isn't typically the kind of product you buy a hundred of and put them on a shelf, right? So most of the groups that we work with, we sell directly to an integrator. Now we do have some relationships with a couple of distributors around the world. Um, one out of the uh, out of Belgium uh, that covers a lot of the northern European market for us. One out of uh, one out of Italy that covers a lot of that market for us. Um, and we do have a, a group here in the United States that does some distribution for us if it's easier to do that. Um, distributors sometimes will give you better uh, terms uh, than maybe we will per se, but we offer a, an 18 to 30% discount to our integrator partners. And that depends on a variety of factors. Are they buying just one or two or five or are they buying 20 or how are they doing that so we can work with them. If you register a project with us, so if an integrator says, hey, I've got a great project, I want to register this, we have an online document you fill out and I get a copy of that so we can register the project with you. When you do that, we give you an extra year of warranty. That's a value of $3,000, $29.95. And that's a value that your competitors that are bidding on the project are going to have to buy. So if the project is like five cameras, you're, you're going to outpace your competitors by $15,000 just with the warranty. So that's one of the ways we want to reward our partners for uh, getting out there and finding projects, you know, registering them so that we can be part of their, uh, their plan. So, um, and the, you know, the different models that you see there on the right under the pricing list, you know, the 6,600 is our longest range unit. So that's the one that's going to get out to four to 500 meters of detection. Uh, the 6,400, a little shorter than that, the 62, a little shorter than that. And then the two that are the 300 or the what we call the three series, um, those are going to be inside of 200 meters. Uh, one of them is about 100 meters. The other one will do, do, be doing about 200, 225. So we've got some charts we can show you on distances and, and all of the testing we've done. But but it's, you know, again, we are being used by very big companies, oil companies, gas companies, um, energy companies, uh, all kinds of groups all over the world. Uh, we're on every continent. Uh, we do ports. Um, yeah, a variety of unique applications that we do out there. It's like you're reading the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it's, um, you know, um, any I can touch in on? Terms, in, well, you, you did kind of there in terms of the lens and, and the detection area right. uh, in that space. Um, some other questions from some of our uh, dealers up in Canada in terms of uh, winter temperature and uh, yeah, no. the, the thermal, Weather, thermal radar is an IP six. It, we're an IP sixty seven camera, so you know, we're we're actually submersible up to a meter for thirty minutes uh, if you've assembled it right. Um, but the uh, the thermal radar does incredibly well in cold temperatures. Uh, I can get you some of the temperature ratings, uh, but we uh, we we we're a, we're a very warm running device, so we run pretty hot and warm as it is because of the computer that's in the thermal radar. Um, but uh, the PC or the, the Linux-based PC that's inside the thermal radar is good to minus 40. Uh, I think it's maybe minus 50 even. Um, but uh, but the uh, heat temperature, we're good to about 70 C. 
So, uh, and, and down to those uh, minus, low minus uh, folks for up in Canada. Okay. Um, maybe I can touch on maintenance. Um, about every three to four years, there's a, a, a component inside the unit called a slip ring. Um, a slip ring is a wire that ties something moving to something stationary. It's kind of an aircraft part, and we buy our, uh, our uh, slip rings from the ma aircraft manufacturer Moog, and they make a really fantastic slip ring for us. And we, but we, we, we tell customers that might want to be replaced every three to four years. Um, the motors are good. The motors are going to be good for 10 years or so. I mean, the motors are great. Um, but that slip ring that moves power and data up those lines, uh, we recommend replacing that every three to four years. Um, and that's field replaceable. So you should be able to replace it right in the field. Okay. So this this has to do more with that angle of view. Um, and, and he's asking it in a little bit different way. He's basically saying if you, if I have it on the top of a two-story home, so a standard two-story home, yep. um, where would the therm like how close to the home would the thermal pick Start up? To pick up. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So what what you're talking about is vertical field of view. So each one of our units has a different vertical field of view, just depending on how you know the, the sensor we're using. Um, so I would I would you know so we, we inevitably are going to have a blind spot underneath the thermal sensor. So underneath a thermal radar, there's a blind spot like a cone and that it won't see because of the uh because of the vertical field of view and the and the sensor size uh, for that so um we'll we'll kind of work with you we have a blind spot calculator that we can work with you on so you say hey i'm mounting this 35 feet high um with this particular sensor this is my blind spot with this sensor this is my blind spot and we give that to you in a radius so probably like we could say it's 10 meters in radius or 20 meters in radius so um uh, we can we can help you with that. We can calculate that. Okay. So, so uh, there are some questions out there in terms of sending you the the presentation. I can tell you we are uh, we've got multiple copies of this presentation being recorded. Uh, we're going to have the presentation up on our website uh, here shortly, uh, so mm -hmm. that you'll have it as a reference. Um, We'll also take all of these questions. If we missed any, any, uh, if we missed your question, we're, we're going to go back through this, uh, the chat log and kind of uh, review it and and get you the get you the answers uh, if we didn't address them here in the presentation. Um, so yes, you, yes, we will make this available for uh, for everybody who's out there. And. Uh, and and I, I was going to say, you know, um, we've got a lot of videos on our YouTube channel, the Thermal Radar YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, uh, you can see some of the videos that we've done, uh, just demonstrations and use cases and various things that we've done out there. So there's some uh, some things you can see out there. And then obviously anybody can contact me, uh, Mike Petty, and my email address there, mpetty at thermalradar.com, and uh, I'm happy to. Uh, get you to the right people. Uh, we've got a, one of our demo trailers that we keep in Tennessee. Uh, we've got a demo trailer that we keep in Las Vegas to service Phoenix and Los Angeles uh, and Vegas. Um, we'll have a new demo trailer for the East Coast and, uh, and then another one in the Midwest here coming up pretty quick. So we, we take these demo trailers around so that we can show you the product uh, live at a customer location so that you can see it up close. So we'll, at any given time, we've got demo trailers that are out there uh, seeing customers all the time. So. Yep. And so, and there was one more question that had come up was basically, uh, you mentioned that it, it runs Spectrum on the on the thermal radar itself. You can run Spectrum. We can, yeah, uh, it's 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 something fairly new because that's this is our new. We're just launching our second generation uh, thermal radar, the new or what what we call the V2 unit, um, and uh, our new V2 that you've seen in these pictures. Uh, we're just starting to ship the very first ones this month in May, um, and so the new V2 has the computing capacity to uh, run DW inside the camera system. Right, so you can run it both um, both on the camera itself or you can send it back. Uh, to a regular VN. Yeah, to, to a regular a, to our, Yeah, 
Yeah, it's through our, through our Blackjack NVRs that are already Correct. preloaded with Spectrum and running, yep. it, Correct. running Correct. it and just running as another device as part of yep. that system that's out there. Yep. That's okay. Um, all right. So I think we've got all the questions answered. Hopefully uh, everybody found the uh, information valuable. I, I, I learned a couple of things. Uh, actually, I have a couple of applications that I'm thinking about just going through it again. Um, Mike, want to thank you for your time. Appreciate no, it. Um, we will, uh, you know, we'll send you a copy of all these questions so that, uh, if you want to elaborate on it. If I missed anything, I'll, I'll get this over to you. Um, for those, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, everybody out there, uh, we are having, uh, Paul is, has an, a, a webinar on Thursday and then we'll have another, uh, partner webinar on Friday. And we've added uh, several more webinars uh, upcoming in the, on our website uh, that you can register for. So we've got uh, we've got quite a few this month. Uh, and towards the end of the month, we'll be uh, doing the sneak peek for version 4.1. So version 4.1 of DW Spectrum is currently in beta. And we'll uh, share that with you uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, so be sure to sign up and register for those webinars uh, so that we can um, fill them to capacity and we can schedule more to keep us busy while we're in quarantine. But <laughs> if there's no more questions <laughs> out there. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And everybody have a good day.